The Responsibility Process by Christopher Avery, Chapter 6, Lead Yourself First. If you are looking for things to change, consider this. You can't lead or mentor others responsibly if you aren't leading yourself. Our ability to lead, teach, coach, parent, or mentor others in a responsibility depends entirely on how effectively we have integrated the practice of responsibility into our own life. This chapter offers some of the top breakthroughs we've seen many people face in their own responsibility practice. The responsibility process works only when self-applied. It is a thousand times easier to see the responsibility process at work in others than in ourselves. Remember this, it's one of the most important principles for practicing responsibility. Most people, when introduced to the responsibility process, start applying it to others in their life and focusing on how others should change. They ask questions like, how can I get my spouse to stop blaming? Or, how can I get my employees to take responsibility? If you're thinking something like this about your partner, friends, co-workers, boss, direct reports, and so on, then join the crowd. You are normal. The responsibility process is a tool for self-leadership. Applying it to other people will never solve the real problem or bring you increased abilities or freedoms. Only self-applying will increase your degrees of freedom, choice, and power. In the following chapters, we look at how to lead and coach others to find their freedom. Right now, you might do more harm than good by intervening, so let's focus on you first. Responsibility Practice Call-Out Commit to applying the responsibility process only to yourself. Catch yourself applying it to others. Change from judgment to compassion. Realize that they are doing the best they can with what they know in the moment and that there is nothing wrong with them. Forgive yourself. Vow to catch yourself sooner next time. Wake up. The cultural trance is exposed. Our society treats personal responsibility as a moral imperative, as in being good or bad, right or wrong, or doing what you should or should not. We say to each other, you should take responsibility, which means you should be good and do as I expect. But we now know that responsibility is more than a moral imperative. It's the mind's framework for growing or not growing. So do you want to succumb to the cultural trance and be normal even though the norm is so mediocre, mediocre, so controlling, and so riddled with angst and unhappiness? Or are you instead willing to explore this new awareness, this gap between what you have grown up believing and what the responsibility process offers? If you choose the latter, and I hope you do, then remember, responsibility no longer describes just your character. It describes your daily practice of freedom, choice, and power. And you get to practice every day because the conditioning of the cultural trance is deep. Responsibility practice call out. Where in your life, work, and relationships are you being good and doing as expected? 
even though it's not feeling free, powerful, or at choice. Begin contemplating what taking 100% responsibility might look like. Every upset is an opportunity to learn. Upsets tick us off. It's hard to read. Every upset is an opportunity to learn and think, oh, joy. So ponder this a little more. Upsets trigger the responsibility process. If you have dedicated yourself to a responsibility practice, then you know the game is to catch yourself copying. The top, typically sloping. Cope. Cope with something difficult. Oh, okay, good. Get yourself coping and get yourself to responsibility. Doing so always results in learning and growth. Yes, you may become aware of something unpleasant that you wish wasn't true. And there will be discomfort and something to confront. This is how we grow. I don't want you to experience upsets. But I do want you to know that growth comes from overcoming challenges that cause you angst. To truly believe that every upset is an opportunity to learn means progressing from the fear of anxiety to embracing it because it signals an opportunity for breakthrough. So if you can reframe frustration and upset from a negative thing to simply an experience that triggers an opportunity for newfound freedom, choice, and power, you will be rewarded. Responsibility practice call out. Think of a current upset you are experiencing. What opportunity to learn is it providing? Take it easy on yourself. High performers who are also newcomers to the responsibility process tend to get angry with themselves when they catch themselves in lay blame, justify shame, or obligation. Of course, this is a conditioned response about being responsible, expecting better of yourself, holding yourself accountable to higher standards, etc. It's the cultural trance. When you do this, you land in shame. Then to get out of shame, you make some rule about what you have to do to be better. By now, you recognize that as obligation. This pattern will not serve you. So when you notice yourself and lay blame, or any other of the coping states, Remember to have compassion for self. We like to say, forgive yourself for being human. There is nothing wrong with you. Rather than chastise yourself for being wrong, congratulate yourself for catching it. Turn it into a win. To operate from anger or chagrin is resisting the truth and will keep you stuck. Forgiveness of self is accepting the truth. You, that you are human, and humans land and lay blame, justify shame, etc. Every time something goes wrong. Giving yourself a break in this way repeatedly every day allows you to learn and grow much more rapidly. Responsibility practice call out. See how many times a day you can catch yourself being angry or annoyed with yourself for blaming, justifying, shaming. Uh, etc., and then letting it go and forgive yourself for coping with being human. What do I want, not what should I do? 
Consider this. If you are like most people, you have learned to respond to many upsets with, what should I do? Check these examples. I just called, to, I just got called to our manager's office. That's never happened before. What should I do? The electricity is off. What should I do? Get the picture? The phrase is so ubiquitous, response. The phrase is a ubiquitous response to the anxiety of an upset or, some t or something gone wrong. The fact that I'm even talking about it probably has you thinking, yeah, so what? It's normal. Well, what if I told you that the question, what should I do, is called up from a perspective of right and wrong and good and bad or should and shouldn't? And that means it maps to the coping state of shame and obligation. Any search for the right answer does because you want to be right to be responsible. Any search for the right answer does because you want to be right to be responsible. Why do we automatically search for the right answer when we're anxious? Because we've been conditioned to. We've come of age during a time of unprecedented expansion of information, data, knowledge, and uh, expertise. We've been taught that no matter what problem you have, Someone has already solved it, and you just need to find that expert, tap into their wisdom, and follow it. You really don't have to think for yourself. You just have to be responsible enough to ask for the right answer and do as you are told. Consider where that's gotten us. We've followed all of these shoulds and should nots right into lies of being good and responsible with lots of unresolved problems. Prosperity on this planet has never been higher, yet anxiety too is at an all-time high. Note this headline. Studies show normal children today report more anxiety than child psychiatrists Patients in 1950s. Normal means to experience more and more anxiety. One of several reasons hypothesized for the high stress levels in the article was pursuing the quick fix for problems. The quick fix helps us cope and alleviate some anxiety, but it never solves the real problem and the anxiety returns again and again. But it's time for a new question. What do I want? Is that better question? Or depending on the situation, what do we want? Or even look at this, a mess. What do we want about this right now that we can do something about? What do I want? It invites you to think for yourself. It invites you to own your role in the situation, and it invites you to see your path to a satisfying solution. Only asking that other questions, what should I do, lets you avoid thinking for yourself or owning the situation. What do I want? Exercise your mind's intention muscle, and by so doing, what do I want? Maps to the mental state of a responsibility. If you are looking for a shortcut to responsibility when things go wrong, ask yourself, what do I want about this? Responsibility practice call out. Catch yourself asking, what should I do? And change it to, what do I want about this situation? Then forgive yourself and vow to catch yourself sooner next time. Relearning how you how to want. If the responsibility process is triggered when we have what we don't want, then freedom, power, and choice comes to us when we discover and pursue what we truly want. Unfortunately, most of us don't really know what that is. We speak of it in vaguely 
We speak of it vaguely like success, money, a relationship, or happiness, but your versions of these are not the same as mine. So the specifics matter. Why don't we know what we really, really want? It's the cultural trance again. We grew up being told not to trust ourselves, but to listen to well-intentioned parents, relatives, and teachers who told us what we should want. Be good. Fit in. Stay in school. Major in a field that's hiring. Go to work for a big, stable company. And on, men on. On the occasion of then-California Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger receiving an honorary doctorate from the University of Southern California and giving the commencement address, Schwarzenegger ended his address with a gripping five minutes on his six rules for success. Schwarzenegger grew up in Austria, took a bodybuilding came to the USA, won seven titles as Mr. Olympia and five as Mr. Universe, has made more than 50 feature films, having the lead role in most of them and served as governor of California. Here he is talking about the first rule. The first rule is trust yourself. And what I mean by that, so many young people are getting so much advice from their parents and from their teacher and from everyone. But what is most important is that you have to dig deep down, dig deep down and ask yourselves, what do you want to be? Who do you want to be? Not what, but who. And I'm talking about not what your parents and teachers want you to be, but you. I'm talking about figuring out for yourselves what makes you happy, no matter how crazy it may sound to other people. Everyone is born with unique predilections. That means you are different from other people. You have your own genius, desires, joys, and passions. Denying them is living your life in quit. Aligning to them brings fulfillment. So start exercising your want muscle. Yes, it is your power of attention. To the more you can align with who you truly are, the freer and more powerful you will be. How do you relearn how to want? I'll give you some ideas in the next four sections. Responsibility practice call out. On a scale of 1 to 10, with 1 being low and 10 being high, how much clarity do you have about what you want in your life, work, and relationships? If your answer falls between the low range, join the crowd. These next sections are for you. If your answer falls toward the high range, congratulations. You're on your way. How to discover what you really want. Here's an exercise you can use to uncover what is most important in your life so that you can increasingly align yourself to it. It will take an hour or two for the first iteration, then you can return to it from time to time uh, to re-examine and realign. Start by managing your energy and mood so you'll feel vibrant and alive while doing the exercise. For me, that would mean getting a good night's sleep, eating and hydrating well, and probably cycling 25 to 30 miles through the Texas Hill Country for inspiration and endorphins. Choose a supportive place where you can be undisturbed for a couple of hours. When I did this for the first time, I was on a cross-country flight in a window seat with no one next to me. Looking out at the sun shining down on scattered clouds and the earth beneath them. 
It provided an expansive feeling. I imagined I was looking at my life from uh, 35,000 feet. The exercise involves generating lots of ideas, then working with those ideas. You can do this on a whiteboard, on paper, with sticky notes, or even in a text editor, word processor, outlining tool, or mind mapping app. Choose what feels supportive and creative to you. Step one, discover a Begin by writing an exhaustive list of responses to this first question. Do not edit while you go. Do not judge your ideas as good or bad, right or wrong. This is an exercise in quantity, not quality. Just write responses after response until you feel complete. Here's the question. What do you want to experience in your life in abundance on a daily basis? Copy this question into your organizer or reminder file so that you can find it when you are ready. In an hour, I had written 31 statements and felt complete. By complete, I mean I felt that everything that is uh, most important to me was represented somewhere in those statements. I also noticed that I was repeating myself as I wrote more items, a sign that I had found most of my most important wants. Here's the good news. If I missed something, or if you missed something the first time through, it will show up sooner or later. And you can revise, since this is a living exercise and always open to revision. Here are a few of my statements. Be a learner and a teacher. Feel 100% free and a choice. Enjoy the love of my family. Score well at the business game. Treat my mental and physical health as my most important assets. Feel free to borrow any of mine that are true for you if they will help you get started. I have no doubt that you have plenty of your own. Step two, organizing. Once you have an exhaustive list, you may want to do a little editing or combining of a few of the phrases that are repeats. Your goal here is to keep your items focused on specific daily experience when you want to do, be, and have in abundance every day what you want to do, be, and have in abundance every day. Resist the urge to reduce them to one word, the generalities like integrity, love, responsibility, etc. Also resist the urge to dramatically reduce the quantity of statements. If a statement has an important element that would get lost if merged with another statement, then keep it separate. In my case, when I cleaned up my list of 31, I then had around 20 specific statements that represented what felt most important to me. Step three, ordering. Now it is time to discover whether some of the statements are more important to you than others. This helps you focus, prioritize, and simplify your choices. Here's how to do it. Ask yourself this question. If I could only experience one of these things in abundance on a daily basis, which would it be? That's correct, only one. I firmly believe you already know the answer at some level, if not consciously, then in your heart or spirit. So as you scan your list, just notice the statement that calls to you, that your eyes keep returning to, that you can feel in your heart or gut or wherever you feel it. Resist logic analysis and what society, your parents, boss, or spouse would say. What matters is what your heart says. Once you find that item, label it number one. Congratulate yourself for discovering it. 
being aware of such a deep intention is powerful alignment for your life. Then repeat the prioritization question, adding one to the number of things you could experience on a daily basis. If you are guided by a religious or spiritual path, you can add that in by asking if God is so benevolent that I could experience two of these things in abundance on a daily basis, which one would be next? When you find that item, label it number two, say yes silently to yourself to claim the win of aligning to a second deep intention. Then, when you're ready, continue to look for a third, fourth, etc. Once again, in this prioritization exercise, notice when you are feeling complete. In my case, after I had 11 statements, I was searching for a 12th. I felt a little tired and burdened. None of the rest stood out as adding anything truly meaningful to the 11 I had already prioritized. Then I looked at my list of 11 and asked myself if it was complete. The answer was yes. At that moment, I realized that if if I were experiencing those 11 things in abundance on a daily basis, then I would also be experiencing the remaining items because they appeared now to be subset of the first 11 even though that was not apparent before I prioritized them, so I stopped on 11. Once you have prioritized the most important items into a list that feels complete, congratulate yourself again on the win. Express your gratitude for the discovery and enjoy the good feeling. Later you can decide what to do with this list. Here's what I did with my list. First, as I faced this new prioritization of what I valued in my life, I had the shocking realization that I was living my life every day as if number 11 on the list were number one. Number 11 read score well at the business game. Number one read treat my mental and physical health as my most important assets. Fear and anxiety gripped me. I worried. But if I put anything else in front of earning a living, will I still be able to earn a living? And then I realized number 11 is still on the list. It is still very important to me. If I put it in its proper place then whatever happens must be what I truly want. This is an example of intention awareness confront leading to a new insight that reveals a powerful truth. I intended to discover what is truly important to me. I did this. I did discover. And then I realized my daily thoughts and actions were out of alignment with it. It scared me to confront what might happen if I realigned. And I faced that fear while looking for new insight, which I found. Over the coming months and years, as I put my life priorities in order, I was able to make a living just fine. In fact, better than I had before because I wasn't compromising 10 more important values to do it. The second thing I did was to print out the list and post it where I would see it multiple times a day. This applies all three keys to responsibility. Intention, I want to align my life and priorities to these 11 statements. Awareness. I grow increasingly aware of where I am aligning, where I am not, and confront. I ask myself, if I say this is important to me, why am I not aligned to it? Is it not true? Or am I afraid to trust it, thus resisting it? Or is something else going on? 
The third thing I did was to occasionally revise the list of 11 as I grew. After a few years, I realized that seven items on the list accounted for all the rest. Then a few years later, after that, I reduced it further. One final word about this exercise. You will notice that we asked what is important, and we ended up with a list of core values. Why did we start by asking what are my values? Simple. Values is a culturally loaded term. If we ask what are your values, you would likely come up with what society said you should value. Responsibility practice call out. What is most important to you to experience in abundance on a daily basis? Since this exercise requires perhaps two hours the first time through, consider scheduling it on your calendar for some time in the coming week or two. Craft better goals. Another way to relearn how to want is to examine your goals from a new perspective of responsibility. The purpose of a true goal is to keep you in motion, pulling you toward the goal. And the goal pulls you to it. You take action, get feedback, learn and correct or continue your course toward the goal. Many people supposed goals don't put them in motion for some reason. That's because the so-called goals aren't really goals. They are shoulds. But they don't actually pull you to them, so they aren't real goals. These are bad goals. Bad because they don't work. If you want to achieve your goals, then start with what Bill McCarley, the father of the responsibility process research, calls good goals. Goals. According to McCarley, a good goal has the following characteristic. Clarity, intention, The more clear you are, better. The more clear you are about what you want and intend to accomplish, the better. Focus attention. If you want to make sure something happens, you must focus attention on it. Remove obligation. Too many goals become a burden because people feel they have to do them. Procrastination comes from obligation. Generate energy. Good goals lead to excitement, motivation, and deep desire to do it. Responsibility practice. Call out. Assess your current goals in every area of your life against this good goal framework. Here are eight areas of your life to examine based on the coactive coaching model, which I endorse and which many of my clients ascribe to in case you are looking for a coach. Family and friends, significant others, fun and recreation, health, money, personal growth, physical environment, career. If you have written goals or a clear idea of what you have been striving toward, then then be radically honest and rate each goal as a good goal or a bad goal, using the four characteristics of good goals. Then confront the bad goals to see what you can do to turn them into good goals. To replace them, or replace them. If you do not have written goals, or are not clear about what your goals are, then ask yourself what you are striving to achieve in one of the eight areas of your life listed here. As you discover what it is, write it in the form of a good goal. Take your time with this exercise. If it takes a week or a month or even a year to discover a good goal, it will be worth it. Beyond Obligation. Listen to this story from Zach Nias, the entrepreneur I mentioned in the last chapter. At the time, he was chief technology officer at a successful startup, Rally Software. Zach wrote, 
before studying the responsibility process and applying it to my life and work, I did not know there was a life beyond obligation. I just thought work was a necessary burden. Almost two years later, I can confidently say it has had a tremendous positive impact on my leadership and teamwork skills. Two years ago, I was struggling to find happiness leading a team of five people. Now I'm having fun leading a team of over 60 people. I am much more present and engaged at work in life, and I enjoy higher levels of teamwork, trust, and collaboration with others. Yes, there is life beyond obligation. I've heard Zach's sentiment repeated hundreds of times by others who have developed a responsibility practice. Many patterns in life and work may look like a burden to you, something in which you are trapped and don't see a way out. Just something you must deal with to live. If so, there is nothing wrong with you. This perception of cause and effect in life is one of the persistent emotional disease of so-called success. It is shared by billions of smart, educated, and well-intentioned people worldwide. But I want to end that. If you desire for a life beyond obligation is strong enough, then simply believe that it is available to you doing the exercises in this chapter and practicing responsibility daily will gradually allow you to confront what you currently may not be able to face. And that will lead to breakthroughs. Instead of giving in to obligation, simply refuse to feel trapped, and then, and that will lead your amazing mind to find new choices. Once again, the Catch Sooner game will support you. Responsibility practice call out. Commit to getting beyond obligation to responsibility. Then every time you feel trapped or burdened or think or say, have to, don't want to, catch with your awareness. Remind yourself it is the coping state of obligation. Acknowledge that you intend to get to responsibility around this problem, that it could take a second, a minute, a month, or a year. Also acknowledge that you really don't have to at all. Instead, you are freely choosing to keep your commitment, even though you are not admitting it. Forgive yourself. Vow to catch yourself sooner next time. When you do this, your mind will begin looking for a new solution. Clarify your needs, wants, and demands. Early or in most people's responsibility, early on in most people's responsibility practice, they encounter the confusion caused by three types of intentions. Their needs, wants, and demands. Getting clear on how you think about your intentions is a great source of personal power. Follow closely. Intentions defined as needs lead us to feeling of lack of scarcity. If I say I need a new suit, then my mind pictures that I'm lacking something. Needs are motivating, but in an anxiety-producing way. Let's take an extreme example. When I was studying for a scuba certification as a teen, one of the exercises was to learn to clear my snorkel while someone on the side of the pool was pouring water in the top of it. Yes, regular access to oxygen is important to living. However, By practicing this snorkel clearing exercise, we were learning to remain calm and not panic when we experience a temporary absence of access uh, to oxygen. I was also a lifeguard, and I learned that the human body is nearly the same consistency as the water we swim in. Therefore, it takes just a little strength and skill to remain afloat. And that means that drowning while swimming is often the result of a person panicking 
when he gets a gulp of water in the airway. So we see that an extreme need induces panic. It is easy to see that a less extreme need is still defined as a lack, a scarcity. The more we define our intentions as needs, the more unnecessary angst we create for ourselves. Intentions defined as wants lead us to feeling of joy, anticipation, and abundance. If I say, I want a new suit, my mind envisions choices, possibilities, and paths to obtainment. Try it. In your internal voice, there's a voice in your head that just said, uh, what internal voice? I don't have an internal voice. Make each of the following statements one at a time, and then listen for your internal feelings and responses. I need to finish this report. Versus... I want to finish this report. I need to go to the store versus I want to go to the store. I need a red Porsche versus I want a red Porsche. I need to find love instead of I want to find love. Some people who try this do not discern a significant difference at first. In fact, some people think it is silly. However, many others feel the difference right away. And the difference is remarkable. So, what is the takeaway? If you want to feel better, more joyous, more in charge, more furry, then turn all your needs into wants. Think about it. Society teaches us to be needy. We unconsciously say, I need, when we could say, I want. And a goal of consumer marketing is to introduce us to new needs we didn't even know we had, which make us feel like we lack even more. Try this mind trick. Tell yourself that science and religion each tell you that all our needs are met. Abraham Maslow says so with his hierarchy of needs. And the Bible, Quran, and other great texts promise that God provides. That means I have no needs, only wants. This frame, reframe works. Now it is a catch sooner game to catch yourself saying, I need to lose weight and get in shape. Recognize this statement as an anxiety producing a bad goal and reframe it to, I want to be fit toned, 130 pounds. Now that you understand needs versus wants, there's a one more type of intention to understand. Demand. A demand is something that will depress you if it is not pursued and met. As an example, Think of this spoiled 16-year-old who throws a fit until you break down and buy her the $200 designer jeans she demanded because her life would be ruined if she had to show up at the party in anything already in her closet. You wouldn't succumb to such a demand from a teen. Good for you. If it is truly a demand of hers, then she'll likely find a way to earn the money for the jeans. Be careful of the demands you place on yourself and others, especially if the demands are superficial. If you demand to belong to the best club in town, drive the fanciest car, have all the best wardrobe, etc., but the economics of your life don't support that, then you will make yourself miserable. I've learned to be selective in my life demands. I have just a few. For one, I demand to experience freedom, power, and choice daily. The thought of not having that depresses me. For another, I demand to earn a living and support my family by doing what I love, which is studying and teaching how personal responsibility works in the mind. There was a point where I needed to earn a living, and I wanted to study and teach responsibility. But I was afraid I would not be accepted and would fail. That incongruent need and want. 
drove me crazy for a while. Eventually, I simply demanded of myself that I find a way to make a living by following my highest value and calling to master and teach the responsibility process. I won't kid you and say that from that moment, it was a snap to earn the living. I wanted to provide for my family. There have been plenty of ups and downs. However, it has worked out, and I can't imagine a better and more fulfilling life. Responsibility, practice, call out. Set an intention to better understand your needs, wants, and demands. To turn your needs into wants and to be selective about your demands. Knowing what's most important to you from the exercise you just completed in this chapter will support you here. For another application, catch yourself using the word need and change it to want. Focus on the essentials. In his best-selling book, The 80-20 Principle, The Secret to Achieving More with Less, successful management consultant and entrepreneur Richard Koch claims that the one true principle of highly effective peoples and organizations is that 80% of results flow from just 20% of the causes. This is widely understood as the Pareto Principle, named after the Italian economist Wilfredo Pareto, who observed that 20% of the pea pods in his garden contained 80% of the peas, and that 80% of the land in Italy was owned by 20% of the population. Applied to business, it is often found that 80% of a company's revenues come from just 20% of the products, or that 20% of the sales force produces 80% of the sales. Applied to life, happiness, and success, it implies that we can achieve more by focusing on less. How can you do that? Focus on the essential, says Greg McCown, author of Essentialism, the disciplined pursuit of less. If you feel stretched too thin or overworked and underutilized, you are likely producing only 20% of desired results from 80% of your time, energy, and efforts. What does McCown suggest? Decide what results you truly want to generate, then decide what is absolutely essential to produce those results and eliminate all the non-essentials. In his book, Anything You Want, Derek Seavers, the entrepreneur mentioned in the introduction, offers a fabulous exercise for identifying the essential and non-essential in life, and it calls on the responsibility process. Here are the steps in my words. Step one, identify all of your commitments. Make a list of every commitment, promise, initiative, project, goal, and objective in every area of your life. It can be a commitment to yourself or to another. Just write it down. Step two, sort your commitments into three columns. The three columns are no yes and hell yes. Since each is something you are already doing, you won't have anything in the no column at first. When applying the responsibility process, hell yes items represent true wants and demands, good goals and commitments you really own. Yes, items are probably shoulds, have tos, bad goals, etc. If this step generates new awareness and and confront, then the exercise is working as it should. Step three, empty the yes column. That's right. Seaver says eliminate half-hearted commitments. He says make everything in your life 
either a no or a hell yes. Like every professional, I sometimes overcommit. Sometimes it's all hell yes things. That's actually a good problem to have. The way I solve it is to confess, confess to those who depend on me that I am oversubscribed and want their help prioritizing. How do I determine if something is a hell yes or just a yes? For me, it's pretty easy. I feel a sense of ownership and responsibility for the hell yeses. I'm pulled toward them. The yes items feel like obligation. What do I do with yeses? If I can't get past obligation with an item to responsibility, then I look to turn it into a no. Maybe it doesn't need doing, or maybe it's someone else's hell yes. When you know that you are free, powerful, and a choice, there's always a way we control what we let into our lives. So saying yes and no becomes important. As professionals, we are likely very good at saying yes to the tasks and assignments we're given. The trick is to not feel trapped by those and to examine what you're saying yes to as well as the higher purpose behind that yes. The hell yeses are for what really defines you. How much more satisfying could your life be if you said, hell yes, I want to do that versus yes, I guess I could get that done. I like to cycle. I'm a roadie. That means I put in lots of miles on a lightweight road bike. My map, my ride app says I've logged 9,946 miles and burned 628,000 calories since I started using the app. Writing is a hell yes, and I live in a writing paradise in rural South Central Texas in a small town called Comfort. I can leave my home office, be on my bike in five minutes, and ride for two or three hours on roads with very little car traffic. I do it routinely, and I do it alone most of the time. It is a highly integrated, i.e. leveraged, use of my time because not only am I getting amazing exercise, doing something I love in a beautiful place, I am also either listening to audiobooks or simply letting my mind wander across my relationships, gold projects, challenges, and problems. I make a lot of progress in life and work in a couple of hours on my bike. People frequently ask me if I'm doing an upcoming organized ride, one of those big events attracting hundreds of riders, often raising money for a cause. For the past dozen years, I've been a, I've been a clear no on organized rides. I'm even a no about getting together with others and riding if it requires any organizing, driving to meet up, or waiting around for people to gather. Why? Because the ratio of invested time and attention to benefit isn't there for me. Riding is essential. Riding with others is not. Responsibility practice call out. Step one, identify all your commitments. Step two, sort your commitments into three columns, no, yes, and hell yes. Step three, work overtime to empty the yes column by figuring out how to make each entry a hell yes or a no. Cleaning up your messes. Do you ever make mistakes? Of course you do. You are human, and humans set out with good plans and intentions, and then life happens. We make a decision that doesn't turn out, or we make an agreement with another person and then blow it. It happens all the time. 
In the previous section, I mentioned becoming overcommitted and how I handle it, dealing with it by owning up and clearing up our messes is critical. Operating from responsibility when things go wrong means owning the consequences of actions, of our actions, and cleaning up after ourselves. Why? Well, for one thing, we learn from it. And for another, we maintain our integrity and the trust and confidence of others who are affected by our mistakes. Responsibility is about the cause and effect forces in our lives. It's about how we integrate the world in which we live. When people and businesses around us mess up and cause unwanted effects for others, we expect them to own up to it, take responsibility, and make it right by cleaning up the problem and making restitutions. People who practice responsibility would have it in no other way when they make a mistake. They want to own it and clean it up. Here's how. Step one. Acknowledge. Let's say you and I had an appointment to meet for lunch today and you forgot. Now you could try to deny it to yourself saying, well, we didn't actually specify. Or you could cope by thinking to yourself, maybe Christopher forgot too, so I won't look foolish. However, we know that acceptance is the fastest path to responsibility. So the thing to do is acknowledge that you blew it. And the person you need to acknowledge it to is yourself. If we can acknowledge our mistakes to ourselves, then we can acknowledge them to others. Step two, apologize as soon as possible. After the mistake, apologize and do it boldly. Don't be wimpy and squirmy about it. Say, I apologize to you. You did not deserve that from me. I don't need to tell you that humans can be really poor at apologizing. We say, If you were offended, then I'm sorry. How passive. That's a conditional apology. It's not owning what you did. The value of a clear and bold apology is that the affected party will more likely understand that you completely own what happened and will learn from it. That makes you worth continuing to trust and have confidence in. Step three, ask. Sincerely ask. What can I do to make amends? This demonstrates that the relationship is important to you and that you are willing to invest in returning relationship trust and confidence to the pre-mistake level. Again, don't come from shame and with a tome of self-pity saying, is there anything I can do? Come from responsibility and say, what can I do to make this right with you? Then listen and either do it or negotiate a win-win. If the other party says, don't worry about it, it's no big deal, instead of releasing a sigh of relief, say, are you sure? Because I don't want there to be any residue of resentment. I blew it and I want to clean it up so we can move forward. Step four, recommit. Finally, Apply the catch sooner again by recommitting yourself to the relationship. Let the other party know that you are making a change in the way you treat your agreement with them so you will be more reliable in the future. You can take this four-step cleanup framework with you and you everywhere in your life. If you engage in it sincerely, it works wonders As an exercise, ask yourself if there are some mistakes, broken agreements, or messes that you have not yet completely owned and cleaned up, and then take steps to do so. Responsibility practice. Call out. Identify where you have failed to keep an agreement or some other mistake or mess you created that had an impact on another person. Clean it up. Claiming wins builds the power of intention. Often when people get what they want, they celebrate spontaneously with fist bumps or high fives. Think about it. You give a successful presentation at a meeting and on your way off stage, 
back to your seat, you do a silent fist bump saying to yourself, yes. Or maybe you pull off a prank on a colleague and claim the win for yourself when it gets goes as planned. You see this all the time in sports when players celebrate a good play or a good try. You see it with kids when they meet an intention and they say, oh yeah, way to go. Claiming wins is a foundational practice for responsibility. I've said it for last in this chapter to make it the capstone. It's that important. We define a win as an intention met. It is something you intended to happen, and it did, or it is something you intended to not happen, and it didn't. In each case, it's a win. Most of us drastically downplay our everyday wins and successes to our own detriment. We focus on losses all day long, which sends us into victimhood. We gripe, we complain, we commiserate and think, Why me? We ate the alarm clock. We have to go to the stupid meeting. We'll have less time for lunch because we need to run errands. Loss, 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 loss. The truth is that we are in charge of our choices even if we don't admit it. But instead of seeing all the ways in which we are free, have power, and are operating from the position of choice all day long, we pay attention to all the ways that we are imprisoned, powerless, and without choice. Let's turn that around. Let's start claiming wins. Each of the sections in this chapter offered you an exercise or practice. That means there is an opportunity to act on an intention. If you want to accelerate your progress, start claiming wins. Do it frequently. Do it as they occur. It doesn't require fanfare and certainly does not require bragging or boasting to others about how great you are. It just requires an acknowledgement to yourself that you intended for something to happen. And it did. As I write this, I'm using a focusing technique called Pomodoro. It has been used for years by creatives like copywriters and software programmers to maintain focus on a task. To use it, you set a timer for 25 minutes during which you work diligently on your project. When 25 minutes is up, you can take a five-minute break to do something else. Or you can set the timer for 25 minutes and go again. For every Pomodoro I complete, I claim a small win. Sometimes I can complete 10 Pomodoros in a 5-hour stretch. That's a win. I wrote 2,000 words today. That's a win. And I got a bike ride in. That's a win. I enjoyed family dinner with my wife and boys. That's a win. And I broke through a stuck point on a problem. That's a win. Now you, think of a win. It doesn't need to be large. A win is not a size. It's an intention met. Did you intend to read this sentence? Congratulations. The more you practice responsibility, the more you will be, the more you will be living intentionally, which means you will notice your wins. And the more you realize how much you are winning, the greater your desire will be to own your life. Here are a few tips about claiming wins. The cultural trance has us focused on losing rather than winning. When we start claiming wins, we think it's pretty, it's petty or ridiculous, or even boasting or bragging. So we edit our wins. Recently, while claiming wins with a team, a colleague said, I can't think of any. Since I practiced winning every minute of every day, this statement revealed how much this person focused on losing rather than winning. He clearly saw himself at effect with no choice in life rather than at cause. So I asked again with more permission to look for a win. I said, 
if you could possibly think of any win of any size, what might it be? I saw him pause and think. I could tell he was mulling over ideas of potential wins in his mind, and then he would shake it off signaling. This isn't impressive enough to share. In other words, he was self-editing. He was denying himself wins. That filter comes from a society that teaches us delayed gratification and that we only deserve to claim the biggest of wins. So we tell ourselves two limiting beliefs. Small wins really aren't wins. The only wins that matter are huge wins. Neither of these statements is true. Self-editing sabotages our ability to act with responsibility. Remember, a win is anything you intended to happen that did not indeed happen, and anything you intended to not happen that did not happen. Here are some examples of met intentions I've heard recently from my clients. I finished the proposal. That's a win. I have a win. I intended to walk two miles during my lunch break every day this week, and I did. I intended not to crash the build yesterday, and I didn't. That's a win. My win is that I intended to pitch management on a continuous improvement experiment, and I did. It is a good practice to notice your requirements for acknowledging something as a win. Did you consider, but discard, Many intentions you'd met because they seemed so small. Consider this. I intended to wake up this morning, and I did. That's a win. Did you permit yourself to see only one of two wins because you thought you didn't deserve more? If so, I invite you to deserve more. When we edit what wins we allow ourselves to celebrate, we will be more likely to stay stuck coping with crap instead of experiencing freedom, power, and choice. This goes beyond positive reinforcement. It is recognizing how frequently we really do have exactly what we want, and that's a win. So we learn to do it again and again and recognize when it happens. Responsibility called out practice. At least once a day came at least 5 or 10 or 20 wins from the past 24 hours. I do this in the morning, after waking up, but before getting out of bed. I review yesterday, looking for the first five wins I can recall. I think to myself, I intended to make significant progress on the book writing, and I did. That's a win. I intended to ride, and I did. That's a win. Claiming at least five wins puts me in a mental state of gratitude and responsibility. A powerful way to start the day. Some of my clients prefer to do it after they go to bed and before drifting off to sleep. When you do, it is less important than that you do it. When you do it, it is less important than that you do it. Summary. This chapter was devoted to leading yourself first by applying responsibility to your experience of everyday life. We applied the responsibility process, the, cre the three keys of responsibility, and the cash sooner game to lots of everyday life situations. We learned the responsibility process works only when it is self-applied. To wake up and expose the cultural trance, every upset is an opportunity to learn, to take it easy on ourselves, to ask, what do I want, instead of what should I do? We relearned how to want and we learned how to discover what we really want, craft good goals, reach beyond obligation, clarify our needs, wants, and demands, focus on the essential, clean up the messes, and claim wins to build the power of intention. In the next chapter, we raise the bar for relating with others as we explore how to lead from responsibility so others will step up to responsibility. And if you feel full with the practice from this chapter and not yet, yet, re and not yet ready to raise the bar, I applaud you. Focus on the most important practices from this chapter until you feel some mental energy to proceed 
to the next chapter. This was the reading of the Responsibility Process by Christopher Avery, Chapter 6.